start recording. Hey, this is Coffee Compiler Club. Um, anything to do with compilers and language runtimes and typing systems and code optimizations and garbage collection and nil or not the nil and Kotlin versus Java versus Scala versus whatever is all fair game. Um, open mic, say what you want. Uh, I reserve the right to moderate. I've uh, never had to do it. You're being recorded live. It'll show up on, I don't know, YouTube within an hour or a day or something. Um, I don't have any set agenda. Um, in fact, I stopped a very nice conversation I'm having with uh, Jim here on doing some crazy things with Kotlin and typings where he's got bizarre, heavily overloaded pairing that he's trying to do interface-like things with and not understanding the performance implications, um, which maybe we'll just carry on that conversation. So why don't, Jim, you summarize your question or your problem again, because a bunch of people wandered in the middle of that conversation. Okay, yeah, so the basic question is whether or not, um, you know, an interface pair uh, is isomorphic, roughly speaking, in Henry Milner with a class pair that is, you know, declared as a class. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I do that, why I made an interface when there already is a class is because it's just not flexible. It doesn't do what I want. Uh, and so I've, I've been uh, having a lot of fun making new things out of pairs. You can make a vector out of a pair. One's an it and one's a function um, and so on and so on. So the question I had is, you know, is there any economy of scale when a pair gets, you know, uh, beat like a dead dog? Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that's where we were. Okay. Where we left off. So, so, so the, the short answer I gave already, I'll give again, is that, that Henry Milner, classic Henry Milner doesn't know anything about classes or interfaces. It just does unification. And there are well-known extensions to add structs with records, which look kind of sort of like classes or interfaces um, that can be unified. And I have an extension that I'm in the middle of with too many other extensions. So I've, I've shot myself in the foot a few times here. Uh, adding a distinction between classes and interfaces where an interface will say, if you have all the requisite fields of the correct types, then you are. Um, and a class says you have to have a particular name, like a person class has an employee and then a manager names or whatever. They have, you have names. And, and if you don't have the name in the class, you ain't. So the difference might be in, in a trivial case, uh, a point object with an X and a Y. Um, if I have an X and Y, I presumably can ask for an area which is just X times Y. And I might have a point object which understands an area as well, but it demands a point object, not a struct with an X and a Y. And the interface just says, I need an X and a Y that are ints and we're done. And a, and a point-based object says, I need a point object, which happens to have an X and a Y that are integers. So that's the distinction between classes and interfaces and what I'm messing around with the Henley Miller. That being said, you said Kotlin, which probably means that you're running over the JVM ultimately, and you're asking like, is there a performance issue because I use all these pairs everywhere? I've got dozens of type aliases for pair. Right, okay. So, so the, this gets into some pieces that I don't know. So Kotlin's behavior on type aliases, if they are under the hood unified to the same type, there's a greater chance that the same code is being executed in terms of Java bytecodes, which turns into the same things getting jetted. If they are not under the hood referred to as the same type, Kotlin produces bytecodes, which are run by the JVM. What kind of bytecodes does it produce? I don't know. So if he produces separate bytecodes, they all get separate compilation. Um, the, the JVM will not take independent piles of bytecodes, discover their identical bytecode for bytecode, lump them together and compile one method for them. It will not do that. So that means you get separate compilation immediately, whether that's better or worse depends on your context. If you're executing it hot enough, long enough, things will jet everywhere. If you don't have a million billion different variations of like lots of not, not, not dozens, but tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, it won't make any difference to the JIT. You'll just get JITted versions of everything, each independently JITted, that's fine. Performance will be the same either way. You, you get yeah, iCache blowout if you get to the you know 10,000 variations. I'm um, really comfortable with Kotlin. It's definitely not about the performance anymore. Uh, that's why you okay. know, mainly I'm looking at what does 
Henry Milner bring to the table um, ah. with this style of uh, minimal abstraction? Yeah. So it just brings uh, a, a way to get strong typing that's sort of uh, more flexible than the usual Java or C style. And I don't remember if Kotlin does a Henley Milner basis. A lot of folks do Henley Milner basis, you know, extensions on Henley Milner for their typing system. So, you know, ML and Haskell and, and OCaml and, and- Cosmetically, yes, but it's Java. Um, so well, what's right. gonna happen if I have two different types that have different memory layouts, but the same interface? I have point X, Y, and I have point Y, X. Okay, so so let's break that. that that's again, that's two separate things. So the specific example of an X, Y versus a Y, X, like he, he, he will give you two separate objects because you've declared two objects. They'll happen to have functionally identical layouts. Now, whenever you refer to X, they, they could be, the fields could be ordered according to uh, uh, the order they appeared in the declaration in memory, or they could have been sorted some other way. They're typically size sorted, but within a size sort order of, of a declaration maybe takes precedence over alphabetical, no one cares. So you probably have two ints. Maybe they're referred to at offset plus zero plus four or plus four plus zero, you know, swapped offsets according to X and Y. Two separate structures, two separate pieces of code generated to access those structures. So from an API level, I expect Henry Milner to unify them, but from an ABI level, I expect them not to. Is yeah, there some way that I should them, be communicating? Right. Here this, is this struct by which I mean a thing that has these fields of these types versus yeah. here is the struct by which I mean this exact memory layout because I'm gonna like hand it to a printer that cares. Right, right. right. And the, the um, there's been work done to look for unification amongst field layouts in the small code size community. So people doing embedded systems work, play these games. Um, but that's not the common sort of optimization and it's not a typing thing. Henry Milner will come along and say, you have an X and Y and you have an X and Y. If you're used in the same context, I'll allow that to happen. Well, then I'll declare that you guys are the same X and Y. So, so, so Henley Miller just starts out and says, I have X and Y, you have an X and Y. Those two are different and I don't care. They're, they're independent things. If they both land in the same place at the same time, then I'll declare that those X's and Y's are the same X and the same Y. That's the unification step going on there. And as soon as you have the unification done at typing time, when you come to do evaluation, there's a chance that it's the same piece of code now. It's the same structural type. It's the same data type, you get the same code generated for it, you know, knock on plastic, and then optimizations flow from that. So you get presumably less code generated. If they never unified, but they both have an X and a Y, probably still you get two different pieces of code. They're treated as two different structures. So unless the underlying VM is doing a structural unification process, I look for two structures that looks close enough that I can declare them to be the same such that I can JIT code that will work on them both when they're actually still independent types, right? This guy happens to have an X and a Y. This guy happens to have a Y and an X. If you say, give me the area, it's X times Y, and I don't care Y times X. But if you say, give me the X field, one had to be a plus four offset, one has to be plus zero offset, right? So the two different pieces of code, because the two different offsets baked into the code. Or I unify the two fields, but then I can't answer questions that distinguish between the fields. And maybe I want to ask questions that distinguish between the fields, or I, I try to. Like you come along and you said, oh, are you an instance of a foo? And one of your guys is a foo and one's a bar and they have Y, X and X, Y. Well, if I unify them together, I don't got no way to tell foo from bar and bar from foo. So, you know, that there's a, things there. So I, I don't know very many people that play the size unification when they're also, uh, um, I picked another person here, when they're also so the trying to do- The thing that it reminds me of is in Scala, it's not that uncommon to have one class that has like seven classes that inherit from it. Right. It happens and, in Java too. 
you want the code that you call to it to have some offset into that object where it's going to find the fields and functions and things. Right. So you really want everything that inherits from it to have those fields in the same order as the parent object has those fields. They do. They do. The parent object is laid out and fixed. All the child object types keep the parent fields in the same location and they add their new fields at different offsets. Right. So if I have three children and one of them has A and B in addition to what the parent has, and one of them has A and C in addition to what the parent has, and one of them has B and C in addition right. to what the parent has. Yeah. No correlation and the offsets chosen for A, B, and C. It can be worth saying, I'm going to make one structure that is my memory structure for A, B, and for all three children. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to have three pointers to the functions, and one of them is just going to be null, and it's worth sticking a null in that slot because it means I can now have functions that just use those offsets and don't worry about it. That's, the JIT doesn't do that, though. That's a structural change made by you, where you took three of your children, declared them to be the same class, but like you went into your IntelliJ. Yeah, I think that said, optimization lives in the Scala compiler, not in the JIT. The, the, the oh, there JIT is a Scala with, compiler optimization doing this. I don't know about Scala, but I mean, we definitely designed to do exactly that, to unify across all of the encountered types within a particular um, call site so that we could basically do that same optimization. So. This would be unifying the data structures. Yeah, and it makes yeah, the data slightly bigger because you get some nulls right. in there, but in exchange, so you get smaller code. The primary oh, use case does. actually ends up when you're inside an array, for example. So I, I create an array. It's got 400 billion foos, bars, and, and bases. Um, I don't want 401 billion objects. I want one object. So uh, that's right. object inlining, which is fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm right. asking, well, okay. The obvious following question is, is given an array element, how do I tell if it's a foo bar or vaz? Because every object knows what it is. Even has the same layout. Yeah, of course. Okay. So you have, you have forced, you've kept the type and you forced the fields basically up one into a parent, maybe a, a virtual parent you've inserted so that we could agreement among the same fields. Right, I basically what, what pulled all the giant that? fields into the parent and made them nullable. And said, okay, now you're now all instances of this one thing that is the parent with some nullable fields right. as opposed so, to three things. So Arthur, things. The, the, what you buy there is you get one piece of code that can operate between the, the same three objects instead of three pieces of code. Right, so we didn't unify, we didn't unify across children's unique um, child classes unique properties though. So the uh, thing that Aaron's describing, we didn't, we didn't do. We simply, uh, we simply optimized for being able to inline multiple subclasses into uh, an allocation intended only for a reference to a parent superclass. Yeah. Well, I'd have to see for that the, in, a, in some sort of picture. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't follow that one. Well, so I have an array of Let's say that we have a base class B and we have derived classes D1, D2, D3. Yeah. I create, I create and fill an array of B, yeah. but I fill it with some combination of Bs, D1s, D2s, and D3s. Yeah. Right. I, you know, if I have 400 billion of those, I'd rather have one allocation instead of 400 billion plus one. Oh, you, but you have the objects inlined in the array directly. As that's the to... reason for the, that's yeah. the reason for the design. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the, all right. Yeah, that's fine. It, but what do you do if your D1, D2, C3s are lopsided in size? D1 you and D2 take are the biggest one. It's a union. Okay. So, I mean, so same D3 way you is statistically see. rare and is huge, and D1 and D2 are statistically common and are small, and you get a giant blow up in size. Right. Remember, so far this is just designed, not implemented. So, okay, but um, getting but, the performance out of this one sounds suspiciously difficult. But but the 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 reason for having the optimization is to be able to choose whether or not you want to uh, inline the object or keep a reference to it. So you still have both options available to you. Uh, okay, and, and this this decision is being made by the runtime. By the runtime, yes, because yeah, okay, because the developer can't know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they can, but typically they don't. Well, not everyone yeah. is clear. Well, even that's not even that. That's fine. <laughs> they know for the first three years until somebody changes something without telling the person who wrote the original code three years. Yeah, ago. and that's true too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and ideally, you know, one, this also works well with other types of optimizations. So, you know, you may have a class that you declare and has 43 fields, but, you know, only three of them get used 99% of the time. Yeah. So you can actually produce multiple, I mean, if you think about it in C terms, you can produce five different structs for the same high level class. Yeah. And then, you know, and so there's, there's nothing that says you have to only have one native implementation of, yeah. of a class. I, I stared at that optimization for a long time because there were a lot of Java classes that exactly had that property. All these fields were null all the time. And these are a handful of things were being used and it varied from here to there. And it was just, that that's one that, that goes all over the runtime and you could do it, um, but- you And know, they're naturally megamorphic as well in those cases, because it's like, you'll have one exception yeah. where it has that field filled in and one exception where it has that field filled in. Yeah, you know. right. And you get all these, yeah, you get megamorphic call sites. You, it looks like a single class you've implemented essentially as five unrelated classes with different fields filled in, but one calls the other, you know, willy nilly. Well, the idea is you start with the one implementation, which is the 43 fields. And then you yeah. say, hey, I've got more than, you know, I've got more than a bazillion of these. So I'm going yeah. to create another implementation that's statistically driven. Yeah. And then only later do you say, oh, I need a third, you know, so each you, additional implementation has a significant cost associated. With it. Well, no, the engineering After cost. The second. So the After engineering the cost second. to do two from one is huge. The engineering cost to do five from two is not so yeah. huge. Oh, I don't care about the engineering cost. I'm actually talking about the runtime cost. Okay, no, you, you'll it, care about the engineering cost. That'll be your life. <laughs> My screen time report for last week was 22.7 hours a day. A day? It's already my life. Like, that's what I do. <laughs> I'm going camping this weekend. I have to not yeah, do this every day. I, all I take time. my computer camping and code. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be raining. I'm going to go camping. <laughs> I'm not bringing the laptop. <laughs> so, Cam, you're coding in your sleep too still? Uh, yeah. But that's uh, with the screen off. <laughs> I, yeah, I seem to remember you telling me about debugging something while sleeping. I, you know, I get those things going on, dreaming in and out, and then like, oh, and I wake up in the morning and I have some answer that I didn't have the night before. My that's favorite story with that is I woke up once at 4.30 in the morning and like suddenly knew how to solve a particular problem, walk over to the computer, write it up, get it fine, go back to bed wake up again several hours later when it's time to normally get up and realize that that was for a project that was four and a half years earlier and had long ago been shipped. <laughs> so you got to tell me it was complete very, junk and you couldn't read it. I've got a variation of that, Aaron. I did the same thing. I woke up, I had this brilliant solution to a problem. I pulled my notebook and you know immediately typed it all up and went back to sleep. Got up the next morning, I hadn't done it. It was a dream that I woke up and did the typing. It's like, oh. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Oh shit, here I am not taking notes. I don't suppose anyone was taking notes. We're gonna have, no. Oh. Cliff at Rebase in July. Oh, excellent. Okay, so we, we podcast are here. Yeah, what are we talking about? We started with, um, in Milner classes versus interfaces versus basically Kotlin. And somewhere here, and where are we at in the video or the chat window popped up as We're well. We're at 20 minutes right now, I think. I'm sorry, I'm taking notes. Someone else can do here. 1024. Lucid dreaming about code. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what so you... we started with, you said that it was too rigid to use classes instead of interfaces for pairs, or it wasn't flexible enough. Yeah. What was the rigidity that was causing you pain? Yeah. Am I asking? Um, perhaps as the Java classes that have finals as A and B, um, which is, you know, very, very final. So I would wind up writing these pairs with an array of two which is actually an array of any length that I use as to um, stuff like that. I just wrote an interface because uh, it has the fewest restrictions, um, particularly 
the standard library in Kotlin makes a couple of assumptions about their former tuple that was replaced by pair and triple, um, ah. which I don't want to deal with that. Uh, they had a good language with tuples and then they backpedaled because maybe Android, I don't know, something like that. But, uh, you know, type aliasing is the fun part, uh, pushing that to the limit, you know, not for the sake of doing Kotlin and JVM, but, you know, for the next language that comes along, which, you know, this is a portable library with very few abstractions if type alias works. Unpopular opinion, final is an anti-pattern. Really? Ooh, that yeah. is an unpopular opinion. Why? It's, so it's, it's, it should it's be evil. default or? No, go no, ahead. No, it's just an, it's just an anti-pattern. Why? why would you ever have final? Why? Oh, you're, you're saying why would you ever, this, you're, you're, you're claiming it should be the default, everything's final all the time, it's no, all no. immutable structure. I'm saying, I'm saying final should not exist. Okay, why? Why? I'm at, yeah, why? Defend. Because, because in a properly designed type system, there's never a use case for it. <laughs> there are optimizations that I can do if I know that the past is not going to change. So oh, actually, that's immutability. That's different from final. I, I totally agree that immutability is absolutely essential in the type system. Yeah. Okay. And Distinguish what, final. Isn't from immutability, immutability why people use final? So what, what Jim was saying is that he wanted to extend the functionality, capability, whatever it is, yeah. of some built in thing. And it precluded him from doing it because it said, no, we know better than you. You're too stupid to safely extend this. Uh, so you're so talking about final class, not final fields. It just, yeah. The, closed the, class that cannot be inherited from your standard Closed standard is pattern. probably, a, yeah, sealed yeah. or closed gotcha. is probably a better way to put it. Jim, did I, did I understand you correctly? It's been so long since I've looked back. Uh, I can't remember whether it was a, a closed class or- um, No, no, I don't mean that. I mean it, final- Forced versus... mutability. Uh, I actually have immutable pairs, but with Kotlin, you just change val to var and you get mutability with a new setter. Uh, by inheritance. So that's a, a no op. Um, it, it's but the reason you had to create done. those new classes is because the ones that they provided didn't allow you to modify the design of the class, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's um, what I, meant. I, I, I could not type alias anything worth a damn, uh, which was the main test, um, which, you know, it's. Uh, it's not great for IntelliJ. You get a, a class uh, expression that's 80 characters long sometimes. But um, other than that, uh, it's an interesting experiment. And uh, Henry Milner typing uh, without the uh, ML or you know um, very complicated development environment would be interesting to uh, port to. That's um, that's where I, I've got. I'm trying to grep all the hundreds of places where I type alias this pair, so I can share that. Um, it, it's cute, just in a retrospect. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, Kotlin is not the goal here. Uh, it's just uh, you know, it, it's uh, I'm too lazy to go back to C plus plus. I think that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just not as much fun. Yeah, I, I, I claim the Kotlin documentation on their types don't say anything about Henley Milner or system F typing or any derivatives thereof. It looks like classic forward flow typing. Um, they have a parameterized typing, so I, I am a little confused. Maybe not, maybe it's just forward flow. Um, I'll throw the link in. Somebody else can tell me what Kotlin's using for a type system. Uh, it's, so in uh, defense of Java, you don't have to declare every type. The inference is pretty good. Uh, and IntelliJ is the compiler's type inference. So what you see in IntelliJ is actually the authentic uh, type differentiation that uh, is the front end. Um, so you can go pretty far with the Henry Milner syntax, if I understand Henry Milner correctly, uh, by using tuples, 
before yeah. you get serious with uh, all the happy Java features of classes and interfaces. So I actually do, you know, a lot of infix tuple creation that is recognized as the class I want just by the type dispatch. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, something that Java cannot do yet. I had a guy beat on the AA type system for a while and implement piano arithmetic in AA types. It's pretty, pretty crazy, but it works. I think I just put a piano typing, a, a piano math in my code this week, actually. There you go. What is, what is piano it. typing? Help me out here. Oh, it's, it's a super minimalist arithmetic. Um, so you have a, a, a null and a successor. And you count from zero up by adding successors. And then you can define an add and a subtract and a multiply. And you get all this classic algebra from like pure lambda calculus with a very minimal starting point. Um, so it's kind of the equivalent of a Lisp uh, list. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but, but if you it, imagine every number is written only as one or one plus one or one plus one right. plus one. Now all of your numbers start to look like a piano because it's like long thing. Short. Oh, I don't think no. It's the guy's name, P E A N O or something. <laughs> no, the, the point is it's um, I need like the basic lambda calculus to do arithmetic. I don't need the laws of arithmetic, uh, the axioms of arithmetic to do arithmetic. I need only the axioms of lambda calculus to do arithmetic. I mean, sure, it's good for expressiveness and performance, but you no, don't need it. No, it's not performance. It's all about expressiveness. And so that's the point. Can you do it? Oh, my God. It means that the laws of arithmetic aren't necessarily the fundamentals. You can go a layer down if you, whatever. But actually, people then show that there's some mutual equivalences going on between them. Yep. I was uh, disappointed one... that, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go, Simon. All right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention one interesting thing you can do. Uh, you, usually people do with this is um, implementing uh, a unit of measurement system where you have these uh, piano numbers and then you have basically uh, you parameterize your unit with like every every uh, uh, SI uh, standard uh, like ah. meter and weight, uh, ma uh, ma like length and weight yeah, and time right. and things. And basically if you have like uh, one meter, you have like a parameterized uh, unit where all the piano numbers of the, like the base units are zero. And you have like for length, you have one and uh, then you can do, as, as Cliff mentioned, all the arithmetic with plus and minus on the type level and have it like checked by the compiler that you're only uh, dividing uh, units. Doing unit math that, correctly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. and um, yeah. Yeah. That, that of course is like uh, not really that beautiful without like a lot of, uh, patching like uh, making sure that you get the units uh, shown in a nicer way than like a huge list of uh, of yeah. piano numbers yeah. and um yeah but it's interesting it's like uh in interesting use case so here's a type extension that can be derived from other types so that theory it says that if i have a Hemley milner based typing system i can do physical unit math in that typing system as well if i just screw around long enough i should be able to get you know, type safe unit, uh, unit math. Yeah, and I've certainly seen systems that essentially treat units as symbolics until the very last minute. If I add an inch to a centimeter, the data structure I get out says one inch plus one centimeter. And if yeah, I multiply no, that by two, I have two inches plus two centimeters. Uh, and... Right, this would be a different thing. This would say inches and centimeters are in fact a length unit, that's fine. Furthermore, I could have a conversion under the hood and I give you an answer back in whatever you know metric, but you can freely convert to any other length metric. But if you added a, a length of one inch to a, a, a one gallon, you'd get a type error. That's the trick. Like the meters to yards conversions would happen automatically, and you wouldn't get a you know Mars orbiter lost error. But the the inches to gallons is the other failure mode where you simply you know got the units wrong. 
you're doing, you know, right. But you probably don't want to do the conversions early. Energy. You want to drag them as late as oh, possible. No, that's so you can see what's going on. I would claim that you, if you get this in the type system, you can't tell, you don't know, you, 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 it's as if, and the compiler does what the compiler does under the hood and we're done. The typing system, whether you convert to early or late or doesn't convert at all, I don't know that you'd care. I actually think, yeah, you wouldn't convert until you were done with the error messages. And then at that point, you can't see what's going on. It's the as if rule and bam, and you know, it happened. Jumping back a few steps to defend sealed classes. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna change the, the comments here. We'll call sealed classes, yeah. Sometimes there's a set where I will have a small number of classes that I need to treat specially in one spot. So I have my days of the week thing yeah. that's got seven cases in it, and it's yeah. just those seven cases. Yeah. And I've got switch statements all over my code base that care about those seven cases. Right. And I don't want to have another function in my day of the week class for every place where it's ever been used. Somebody but I also to... don't want someone to come along and be like, I added an eighth day of the week and I broke you in 10,000 places. Right, right. Well, if your switches are exclusive, then adding the eighth will give you error messages in the 10,000 yeah, I do get places. a compiler error in the thousands of places. Right, so, so if, your can... switch, if your switches are not exclusive because you just dropped off the last case as the default, then the eighth guy also falls in the same default bucket, which is surely not the behavior you're looking for. And of course, the other one, as you just said, it is you need a default implementation wherever you had a switch. If you did virtual calls and so switches, you have a default implementation to every switch, which factors the code wrong in the first place and gives you a million default implementations, which don't make any sense if they're never used. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I, I'll agree that that sounds like a reasonable time to go seal that class. And an enumeration is in general like a sealed class, basically. In fact, I think it's semantically equivalent to a sealed class. Does anyone have an opinion on treating sized integers as a sealed class, essentially? I'm, I'm going to have this switch statement over my int 32. And if I don't cover the entire space or have a default, it gets mad at me. Oh, yeah, oh. We, we do that. Yeah, I have a question about enums. Actually, I've got a benchmark that runs through uh, like eight variations of XOR swap that no longer are XOR. Um, so it looks like they get slower and faster over time. Um, it, I will post that. It's a one yeah. class Java yeah. file. For Kotlin. Yeah. So, um, so be does warned. it be optimized if you roll through an enum? Okay, hang on. As soon as you go to a micro benchmark performance numbers, your, your performance can get really wonky really quick. And you have to have some deep knowledge of what's going on, or you will just be fooled. You'll be led down the garden path of disenlightenment and not have a fucking clue what's going on. Usually followed by people shouting very loudly that X is faster than Y, when blatantly there's no correlation between X and Y. And I've been on, you know, I've fought this fight for 20 years um, because of Java performance having issues that were not. So wait, are you saying problems. that the benchmark game is actually just a pile of turds? I unfortunately Sorry, that's a I shoveled that's a in that barn. The, uh, the, the or, benchmark game is a website of some sort. That... No, yeah, yeah, totally. No, no, I, I, I played the Hercules and shoveled shit in that barn for twenty years. Um, it, it, it got better slowly. Um, in the case of a JVM, you want to grab the JMH project or Caliper at one point. I think it's been renamed again. Um, to go do performance me measurements of microscopic things in a JVM, or else there are any number of pitfalls you can fall into if you handwrite a, a optimization. And I, I don't know which ones you fell into, but I can almost guarantee you fell into several of them. Um, having watched people who didn't understand what was going on fall into them over and over and over again. But the flip side of that is building a corpa of performance tests based on real world code. It's yes. quite yeah. a lift. It, it, yes. And as soon as you go- Particularly to, if there's not a lot of AA code that exists in the world. If you go to real world pieces of code, your performance issues are very different. 
And the stuff you get out of micro benchmarking is almost unrelated in all ways to performance you get out of a macro benchmark. It's all well and good to say, I did pair this way, I did Zor swap that way, this is faster, that is faster. Well, it's like an electron microscope is a good way to look at it. You, you zoom in on the microprocessor performance metrics at a super high rate. It's like zooming in on the eyeball of a fly. Like, what the fuck are you looking at when you zoom in far enough? It's some random ass thing and the fly twitches slightly and it looks utterly different than it did before. Same as a processor. You zoom in too close and you magnify some crazy thing you're looking at. And then the processor gets into a different epicycle and they totally run epicycles. Um, and you get very different performance numbers out. And all of them are sort of junk because in the macro case, it's all about statistical behaviors. And you're not measuring statistical behavior if you get into a micro benchmark game. Although I will say the uh, Chrome guys at Google recently got a change through to how um, the ASCII number to integer was implemented for C++ and managed to cut about a third of the cycles out of that. And boy, does it make a difference to Chrome if every single time you try to turn a string integer into an integer, it runs a third faster. They did it, you mean the, the conversion done by the native C code or something or the libc or something? Yeah. The okay. actual C++ code for turning strings uh, into integers in base 10. There are definitely compiler optimizations in C2 for doing base 10 string conversion that were that put big performance numbers in when, when they went in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Jim posted a link to his, um, to his benchmark, and uh, I, I spot a couple of issues. And I've got an updated one with a few more tweaks. Um, but one of the interest, two of the interesting things are, one is that there's a, a, a swap with two temps and there's a swap with two final temps. And uh, the, the swap with two final temps is a little bit faster. Um, and then there's this um, byte buffer that comes in from behind uh, as the winner about half the time, once the JIT is warmed up. Um, very curious as a, as a swap. So um, what surprised me is that using um, a long with um, MISC unsafe, uh, do, uh, swapping two integers with a long is about the slowest consistent uh, performance in a for loop. So um, I will post that, it, it's in code. Uh, yeah, I'd have um, to go start staring at it. There, there are certainly, crazy things going on in here that I, I claim will lead you down the garden path of disenlightenment, um, including not necessarily running long enough, uh, encouraging jitting performance of the first run versus later runs. And uh, uh, I don't know. Does anyone have a good Ray. tool for Given this snippet of Java, show me the assembly that comes out of the JIT when uh, it's doing the heavy version. Oh, uh, you have to go get the you have to go get the flight recorder. You, there's a flag you oh. do it too. You know, in the old days, boy, I had that just pop right out. Now you have to go get flight recorder or something. There's a way to do it. It's a pain in the neck. The flight recorder will give you not just path, the yeah. JVM bytecode. It'll give you actual assembly. I think one of them will. One of those tools, and maybe it's that one, will give you the actual assembly. Yeah. Is it still uh, this way that you have to download the HS this thing separately? Yeah, the, right. The, there's a there's a disassembler piece that comes around that you can get. Some I want to say somebody has a tool, and I don't say your kit. Somebody has a tool that will actually go get the damn machine code out. Um, yeah, hotspot profiling using JitWatch. Oh, JitWatch. There you go. So throw these into the doc, not just the chat. Uh, the doc was in the mail. I'm getting better about reliably putting the doc in the mail. Um, Do you yeah, put the doc in the description of the YouTube games? video also? I'm sorry? Do you put the doc link in the description of the YouTube video also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I shut off editing on it after a little while and then I put it in the YouTube video. Um, yeah, I, I would claim, uh, I would start by profiling with your kit and see if there's an obvious stupid thing going on. And then I would back it up with uh, anyone's assembly code once it got down to that level. 
But I would start with I would start with JMH and see if he gets a different answer because he does a he does the hard work to verify that you're not fooling yourself. Like some of these things get constant folded away or not. Some of these things have like crazy allocation patterns that you didn't like defeat against, and you have actually giant issues with allocation rate. Some of these things. Um, like, you know, this just came along. There was actually a use case where XOR swap was an option. And I guess I was like 15 years too late for the optimization part of it. Um, so yeah, JMX requires some kind of tooling. Um, I just wrote one bench. Not JMX. JMX. JMH. Yeah. I'm going to find uh, a link for that. So, I put it in. The, I already put it in. Oh, thank this you. This doesn't come with a a Maven build file or anything yet. Um, and, you know, I actually forgot about it for a couple of years, but um, I, I picked it back up for the sake of looking at Kotlin. Uh, and yeah, in Kotlin, you can see the bytecode that is uh, emitted, uh, the Java bytecode. Not that that's uh, anyone's main language. Yeah, I don't know if familiarity with reading Java bytecode directly is a good sign or a bad sign. Yeah, I unfortunately got there pretty close. Again, not necessarily a good or bad sign. A lot of these core inner loops look functionally identical. I claim no difference should be happening after the JIT's done and you're looking at random noise and the, and the low quality of your harness. Um, the int buffer wraps, well, they might get totally peeked through. Yeah, that could disappear as well. The uh, random access int buffer, it, it, it uh, goes neck and neck with the two variable swap. Yeah, yeah, it, it might have gotten entirely peeked through. Um, That's why I was curious if the JIT just sees through these things and produces the same code for a bunch of them. Um, yeah, right. A bunch of them, I suspect it's the same code and you're looking at random noise based on the, the, the issues in the, um, in the harness. So I see a harness say one to 11 followed by digits six to 10. So that's sort of a hundred trip counts through swapper.swap .swap values, which uh, calls the virtual call in the doesn't got, yeah, okay. So, so for starters, you're, you're not running your rep count enough to get a warm up pattern. So the rep count should be 10,000, not 10. Um, the digits That's at another nice. factor of 10, so maybe you could do a thousand by 10. You're running it all in a single main loop that requires an OSR to flip from the interpreter to the jitted code. That'll hit your performance also. Um, these are all games that JMH will take care for you. Uh, your actual current time Millie's call wraps a single call to swapper. Current time millis is done by the best case effort called the Linux current get time of day, which is about a dozen memory loads repeated twice to assume you get an atomic load. It's pretty fast, but it's slower than your swap. So the cost that you're measuring is the cost to do two current time millis, a swap, a load in a test field before you have the second current time millis. Your overhead of the loop body is probably triple the cost of the swap itself. So you're measuring three quarters of your time doing current time millis and one quarter is swap plus or minus random noise. So I claim that this benchmark will give you a lot of random noise I, in a variety of situations. And then, and then eventually maybe if you keep the rep, rep count high enough, the JIT kicks in and something flips from the interpreted state to the JITed state. I'd, oh. I'd also, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'd also be uh, uh, worried that uh, whether the result is is used enough. I'd say, 
he he does he tests because yeah, it's like uh yeah, it tests and then uh does uh, like um it throws an exception but after that yeah that's, that's good enough you, you tested the you, you tested an array element so for it to disappear the the array has to be inlined by unrolling sufficiently to recognize that you have the entire body of a variable sized array um so he's done some stuff with parse double digits on digit counts which will probably not get seen through by the jet so the size of the array is unknown from the jet's point of view you grab the first element and then you test the last element you call swap there are like six different implementations of swap it's unlikely they're all been inlined with a breakout so likely is not the jets decided to make a v call for swap um which is probably actually an interface call for swap followed by is that a swapper on enum as an abstract the bottom it might be a virtual call a little cheaper as a virtual call um yeah and check the last so i think that's that one's i think is okay i think the failure is the hot inner loop says run 20 clock cycles to get current time millis run 30 for a v call run three for the swap run 20 for current time millis i've got 80 70 80 clocks of overhead versus three that I'm trying to measure. And statistically, that's really difficult to tease apart the measured value there. That the, the much better answer is to uh, move the current time millis out and hot on the inner loop. And then you'll still have the issue that you'll take 30 clocks for a V call and three to do the swap. And again, JMH can save you here by doing the necessary grunt work to allow you to loop over the hot code in a way that the compiler won't get rid of it, and a way that the V call won't dominate your performance. So anyhow, I, I claim that you're looking at random numbers at the moment, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah, the last, the last two or three frames uh, are consistent. Uh, between runs, um, it, it, yeah, the difference is a uh, factor of four, uh, roughly. Right. So, so sitting it down and in a in a in a, in a in a proper dev environment that I don't have in front of me, and starting turning on when the JIT kicks in and when it doesn't, and looking at the trip counts and whatever, I, you know, I could start my my old school techniques of finding out where your time goes. Um, I would grab somebody's flight recorder or JMH as a starting point these days. Back in the day, I could totally whip out the assembly code and tell you where your mistakes were, and I could get there again, and it would take me an hour of screwing around. So I'm not. So Jim, I'm just curious if you're looking to see how Java optimizes it, or how the processor actually would be optimized. Are you is this uh, is a Java benchmark versus a, a low level? This was the first time I had an actual swap use case in my code. And, you know, it was so many years since I read, you know, the way to do swapping quickly is use XOR on both of them. Um, so it turns out that's one of the slowest ways to do it yeah, these days. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, the real big surprise is the random access byte buffers are blazing fast right now. Um, the I, I claim the, that's that's an artifact of your bad benchmark. Okay, well, uh, they, they are good, is. but so are the other techniques, except for Zor. Zors are bad because so, the processor won't optimize them as much. So the main benefit well, but of then Zor... you can expect a, a compiler to recognize the Zor pattern and replace it with a proper. Like, I, with a proper... I, I wow. looked at doing the three Zor pattern in C2. It's just like, you know, this is like somebody's stupid benchmark. I'm not going to screw with it. You, you, you want to hurt yourself, hurt yourself. Fine. So I, yeah, I think my that... philosophy has increasingly become try to speak clearly to the compiler. If I yeah, say exactly. temp equals A. Yeah, yeah. B equals yeah, ten equals whatever. Yeah, you do the swap. Like, get the compile, it kind of, is oh, three wait. instructions, and it is the thing that the compiler yeah. author is looking for for how to do the swap, and yeah, they're, they're going to replace the code I wrote the with thing named something. Temp. They're looking for you to use temp, and they're like, "Oh, that's a swap." Yeah, I'm just so taking the, the Zors. The benefit of pattern matching the Zor pattern is like somebody fifteen years ago wrote this, thinking that this is performant, and it's just sitting there in legacy code. 
yeah. if if a compiler today can recognize it and say, hey, there's a better way to do this, well, why not do that? That's fine. It's like oh, okay. because the to-do list is infinite and your time is finite. It's okay, actually isn't really the main tiny benefit of the swap, too, swap too easy. Swapping two registers? Like, no, 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 no. No, no, no. You go to the IR and you say, I have three swaps. I'm going to replace them with two defs and two defs with crossing lines in the graph IR. No, no. And now the sorry. register allocator does town on it. I don't, there's no machine code screwed here. No, what I was saying is back in the olden days with a very limited set of registers, we would Zora swap only between registers. I never did immediate IMM Zoras. To, to memory, yeah. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? That was uh, strictly because you were out of registers and, to do a swap. And this is all, if I'm, I don't know what Hotspot's doing, but, you know, the code is written as none of this is registered. It's all, it's all IMM. How do um, I get direct memory in Java? Like, array is the closest you get to pointer. Okay, an array is as performant as direct memory in almost all cases. There are some exceptions. In particular, if you have short trip counts, then you get a lot of range checks, which are pretty cheap, but not zero. So you do, if you do zero, array offset of zero and array offset of one, you get a lot of range checks that aren't going to go away. If you just have a struct with two fields, A and B, I mean, what, what kind of direct memory are you looking for here? This, this is about as direct as it gets. Yeah, the benchmark stops when you start to hit um, max int size arrays uh, with one more zero. And uh, with um, Miss Gunsafe, you can't get there. Um, you can't get to uh, number six with uh, direct access. It just, it chokes on the allocation. Um, right, that's, so, that's, right. That, that's an allocation issue. It has nothing to do with direct access. Hey, make um, an array of 100 million elements at eight bytes per, that's 800. You know, megabytes. I, you know, there's a two gig limit there, or something like that. There's a limit. There's yeah. There's a whatever. There's a Java optimization switch. Not optimization. It's a Java switch that changes your memory model. I haven't gone there. It's not worth it. Like if somebody put this in a JMH harness, they'd probably be spending as much or more time as I spent writing this and uh, testing it a few years ago. No, um, no, Jan Mitch, H Harness takes this kind of shit as an input. I mean, you have to screw the parts out, take your swap implementations and tuck them off to the side a little bit. But then that's what he's for. I don't understand that comment. He, he'll eat that up and spit out reasonable numbers. It's an RTFM thing. <laughs> yeah, you have to go read the manual. Right. Yeah, and well, the point of reading the manual here is that you're doing it wrong right now. Reading the manual is how you learn what pieces you have to break out and how in order to do it right. And otherwise, you fool yourself. Hey, this is faster than that. Oh, that's faster than this. No, you got random numbers, guy. You're drawing conclusions from random numbers. That This is the fight I fought for 20 fucking years. I had to really oh. smack people around, and I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of it. <laughs> It no, I, I don't solved. make claims as to the efficacy of the, the test, but that, you know, in my, you know, uh, offhand, um, you know, one, one time yeah. attempt, yeah. I do nope. see something consistent um, and some surprising, which I, you're saying is, you know, noise. Yes. So many times I have seen people come with a benchmark where the mistake was, they said for I equals one to a bazillion, call A, then call B. And the answer was the compiler said, hey, call A a bazillion times, inline the fuck out of it. Oh, I can constantly fold it. Oh, it's completely dead. It's infinitely fast minus the jitting time. The time to run a billion iterations is 100 millis of running in the interpreter, 100 millis of jitting and zero. 200 millis, flat number, independent iterations. The second guy says, oh, I have a virtual call. I can't do the inline game anymore. I cease to inline and make a inline cached virtual call. It does a billion iterations of calling your thing. The second guy is a billion plus 100 millis to, to interpret, 100 millis to jet times a billion times two clocks. One is The first one is independent of clock site of iteration count. And the second one's got some overhead. 
And you swap A and B and oh, look, B suddenly the fast guy instead of A being the fast guy. And the numbers are fucking random. So, well, so I will I'm be not... really impressed when I see that it, you know, takes the hint and does memcp of the last n minus one bytes and moves them to the top and swaps the first byte to the bottom. Uh, I haven't done that yet. But, I'm, I'm um, just saying, I'm just saying you have set yourself up for getting bogus numbers. And the, what the actual nature of the bogus numbers are is kind of not important. The, the important point is they're very likely to be bogus and you should not be trusting those numbers. So let's say we want to flip the question around. Hypothetically, if I had some large database that I wrote in a jitting language like Julia and it was being too slow and I hire Cliff and say, hey, make my database less slow, what are the steps you actually take to figure out where all your time is going? Well, the first thing I said was your data structures are all wrong before I looked at anything. And, and you know, this is not how you do big data fast. And then the, you know, the answer came down, we must use Julia, you cannot do anything else. So then I started taking, you know, the performance, give me a benchmark that you guys cared about and you make it big enough to be important. And we did classic benchmark analysis and the classic benchmark analysis came out. You know, I looked at assembly code, I looked at inlining patterns. I looked at the data consumption. That sounds like you're running into a lot of these same problems we had with the small benchmarks, no? Yeah, yeah. As soon as you play micro benchmarking style games, you have, you run a bunch of these issues. This was a bigger problem, so they didn't have the micro benchmark issues per se, but they're repeating a lot of big data loops is in theory what they're trying to do. In practice, they, they had um, way too many types that Julie was expanding for them all as separate types, which turned into separate code. So they had iCache blowout. They had no jitting, like Arthur's worked very hard to make jitting work with LLVM and the Julie team has not gotten there. So the cross calls between independently jitted pieces is done through a pretty painful trampoline because of the virtualness of where they're at and what they were using and the, the size of the jitted components. They made those cross calls a lot, billions of times a second. Each cross calls through a trampoline, not a direct call instruction like Java, you cross call between JIDA component, JIDA component. It's a hardware call instruction with a hardwired address from here to there. That's a lot of engineering to make that work right, to handle all the cases, to back out and rejet and recompile and blah, blah, blah. But the performance of that is the best you're ever going to get out of an x86. You know, it's, it's, it's half a clock cycle. It's not even one. It's, it's less than half. Okay. Julia wasn't there. They were load from a fixed spot in memory that was a trampoline that got changed periodically and call register which if you do it once or twice in a few places, the branch target buffer works. The branch target buffer has, ah, you know, a few hundred, few thousand entries. Okay, you do it 10,000 times, you blow out your branch target buffer. You get no caching of those calls. Every single one of those calls blows out in the cache and it takes 30 clock cycles. And that's your common hot inner loop is taking 30 clock cycles every fucking call sign. But they had those issues. Then they had giant data blow up issues where they took small data and they wrapped and they wrapped and they wrapped. And suddenly they had a 10X, 100X blow up in the data they were trying to work over. And then they ran out of bandwidth. And, and you just could roll through these problems one after another. And the solutions for them all were all sort of straightforward, but they all started with and rewrite from scratch. So your main advice is operate over arrays. No, don't route your no. My main advice is to understand what you're fucking trying to accomplish before you start writing code. If you need to move fast and you're willing to take a performance hit, that's a great answer. And you write what's convenient to understand what you're doing and you get your problem solved. If in the end, the goal is I'm, I'm going to be running on data sets of size, you know, billions to trillions, that's going to make a difference. And you need to think about data first, not about functionality first. So, so you're suggesting the waterfall architecture approach. Uh, am I suggesting? Yeah, exactly. No, exactly the opposite. The, the waterfall approach is really great to, to if you knew what you're doing up front, and they don't. And so they had to explore, and it was time to rewrite. They figured out what they wanted to do. They have a good answer, in theory, in some database -y way. 
But oh, I mean, you've given that advice before of cross the jungle with a machete first until you find the city of gold and then build a road. That's exactly the advice. Now it's time to build a real road and they wouldn't take it. So I think then the context of benchmarks, um, <clears throat> like Rust uh, has actually some sort of built-in functionality for benchmarking. It's kind of hidden. You have to use like their, their nightly builds, but uh <clears throat> they have one particular function called a black box specifically meant to sort of help you with these optimization cases um where the general idea is you know, if you have some value that you are pretty sure is going to be optimized away you pass it through the black box and mm. i think in some cases it can still be optimized away but it becomes uh, less likely yeah, so it's I, basically a magic identity function. I give you back whatever I took, but I also I, stop. I, I, I don't remember exactly how it works. It's yeah. it's deviously simple, uh, so it doesn't work for all cases. There, but, there is a C2 node in the IR for exactly this. It's called the right. opaque node. The compiler is not allowed to see through it. All right. Um, but... Even so, the, the standard benchmarking library is kind of shit. Well, it, it works. And if you have like a benchmark that doing, is doing something heavy like IO, it's OK. Uh, the API is just a bit clunky. But yeah, if you start doing things like, oh, I have you know, a Fibonacci or factorial in uh, tail recursive versus iterative, you know, which one is faster? Uh, probably in both cases, the thing will just say, oh, yeah, both took like one nanosecond because we compiled it, you know, folded everything away. I've literally uh, done that in trying to benchmark Fibonacci. And yeah. then I look at the assembly and the assembly is return number. And you're like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's so what I asked for. There, there are, um, <clears throat> there's a, a other benchmarking library for it, uh, Criterion or whatever, impossible name. The API is kind of annoying to use, but they try to do a bit better so they have like warm-ups and they have comparisons between past and whatever and you can plot um but you still at the core have that issue of if you write a factorial it's kind of get optimized away uh so personally i'm of the opinion that generally micro benchmarks are basically useless uh unless you're you know your purpose is to actually do a micro optimization and you somehow guarantee that the code isn't optimized away. Um, outside of that, I th think you're better off with like um, the issue is I guess integration benchmarks. We sort yeah. of benchmark the whole system. Yeah, but but the issue well, with the micro benchmarks is they're fun to my write. You think you know home, what's going on? My benchmark take home was that the XOR swap is slow, and the simplest swap. Yeah. Well, with two variables yeah. is fast. Yeah. If you look at machine code and what the compiler would do, but you demanded three ZORs or you did not demand three ZORs, the x86 will run the three ZORs as three instructions and three clock cycles, one, two, three. And the swap almost surely turns into a reg reg adjustment in how the code is referenced and costs nothing, literally. If it turns into a single move instruction, which maybe it turns into a single move, an x86 will eat any number of moves in the A clock cycle for free. It's not quite that. There's a limit of like four, but it'll eat a move without burning any other fraction of a clock cycle, unlike a Zor, which has a data dependent operation. He can't. So you're talking around. eating a move for uh, register to register, right? Yeah, yeah, register, register. No, if you're doing memory ops, you, you suck for doing memory ops. And that has and that's all what I was time. saying earlier is that this optimization, the Zor optimization, we only used on, on registers. Yes, we right. never used right. it for memory if, memory. if you're swapping two fields in memory, memory costs completely dominate and all other things are trash. Right, exactly. Because the x86 is itself compiling to a microcode and doing its own register allocation that's going to eat most of those. And it'll eat them up. And that's the one clock per ZOR is the best x86 can do with those. Whereas the reg reg move, he can shuffle them under the hood. They will just disappear in the noise. Whereas yeah, a the memory reason. op will require you to actually eventually write it out, read it in, do all kinds of stuff. And there's a load store units are way more oversubscribed. But there's one other reason why we did the ZOR, the three ZOR swap between two registers and that's to save a register that was what i did it when i did it back in z80 right. you know eight right. eight bit registers 
four 16-bit combos I swapped. Okay, yeah, yeah. But that was- The 80 and 6502, those are the only two things I could afford. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a 6809 for a while. It was a much funner chip. That's Motorola, right? That was a Motorola. Yeah, yeah I think I so. I couldn't afford anything. I couldn't afford anything from Motorola. That's like the highbrow kids, you know. You, you lived on the other side of the train tracks. Oh, you probably man. had. You probably got I, clothes from a store. That that was my, you know, summer's worth of hard work to buy a Radio Shack color computer. It had a sixty-eight oh nine in it. I worked all summer for that. In fact, See, I made, now I feel young. I got my first computer because my dad got a new computer for the office and was like, here, kid, have fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got calculators that way because my dad was a chemical engineer and I got the hand-me-down calculators. Uh, dims were the days. And by the way, my 6502 was used, as was the Z80. So not only could I only afford those, but I could only afford them used. <laughs> Nice. Clearly, should have just gotten in the Zool box in those days. Uh, I, you know, I, I was... did consulting contract jobs, like even in high school, and that in Houston. Houston's like cheap ass place. What the hell? I ran the computer for the St. Luke's Blood Center downtown in the medical center as a high school kid. That was, you know, good money. I didn't know what the hell to do with it. It was a weird weird path to get there i claim i saved a life somewhere by running a custom query at late at night for some lady who was in a car crash and had bizarre AB negative blood or something and my custom query searched the city of houston for a match and i found her sister which i told the police and they ran off to go wake up the sister at three in the morning come to the hospital and donate blood for your sister Probably it was AB positive. If it was I don't know. Dynamic. It was something weird. And I had to, you know, this was back in the day of cards. I had to go hand edit the deck to put the custom query in and then sit around for 30 minutes or an hour, ran through the, you know, million people and then out popped a number. And I told my boss who told the cop who's sitting right there, who radioed something in. And, you know, I later so got the news the next day. That is literally the game of pick a card, any card. Yeah. Yeah, 27 card pickup, yeah, you drop a deck. I've done that. Fine. Dim's days are gone, it's all good. So speaking of queries, I'm sorry. I'm actually, that's, I said, speaking of queries, that's one of the problems I'm working on right now. Excellent. So- I was wondering when see was gonna to get to actually writing the database. Oh, we have it, we have a database. Yeah, they have, yeah. yeah. We have two databases built in ecstasy. One of them, though, I think we just deleted. So I think we're down to one. Um, we, uh, we have to reverse engineer the, the uh, you know, I think map reduce. So we have to reverse engineer the reduce. Um, so we know how to automatically index for it. Because the data is all persistently stored on disk, right? So if you have to touch the disk, you lose. Yeah, so. it's a usual story. So basically, whatever your query is, we have to turn it back into uh, metadata. Oh, um, I see what you're trying to do. Because yeah. the, the queries are lambdas. They're already compiled down into some module somewhere. We have to, oh. we have to actually reverse engineer them to know which data they're going after. Well, why you look, why you look <laughs> awful? It's structured information. It just is Why is reverse engineering better than just keeping that metadata as you're boiling down? Yeah, right. Because if you keep it as metadata, then it's a string like SQL, and it's not type safe. You have to re-parse it. No, 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 no. You cook the metadata down into something that's type safe as well. And then you, you can. Yeah, you know, that's how we did it in coherence. And I like if you're the if you're the developer of the query engine, that's optimal. It's perfect. Like you get everything handed to you the way you want it. But if you're the developer of the database, it sucks. That is, if you're the application developer. Sorry. Uh um, right. Because if you want to do a query, you either hand it a string or yeah. you hand it the parse tree for the string, right? So basically yeah. you create a node that means query. Well, and then you have a query that's a, you have an equals node and a greater node and a less than. No, node. no, that's no. Okay. Do. I, I, I just said you, you just reparse. The parsing step cannot be the slow part of this. Yeah, but parsing is checked at runtime. You're trying to demand, uh, yes. no, 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 yeah. Okay, well, then all your queries have to be up front. Nah. 
I'm not saying that you can't do parsing at runtime. What I'm saying is that if I hand you a Lambda and say, go get these things for me, and it captures some parameters or whatever else, right? I want the database to be able to optimize that just as much as, as it could optimize, you know, a string query. Yes, in the land of H2O, I went a different route. Which Isn't this tough. basically the same as uh, query planner hints, so for example, yeah. Postgres? Because yeah. uh, I, I don't remember exactly what the, the syntax is for, but I believe it's just part of the SQL syntax using you know, whatever extensions they have. Yeah, but SQL syntax is strings, right? Yeah, yeah but, but so they do parse it. Uh, and I, I think... And, and the complaint um, was it's not type safe. So you parse and you fail parse time. You parse a string and you say, the guy's lying to me. It's not a SQL string. I hate you. Right. Okay, now you, you know, get a type error. A, if you don't want to parse a string, I guess you could do like a stream of bytes, but you still have to parse that to some degree. We're, no, I'm asking, or I think I, what I heard Cameron say was, I want to be able to assert that at some point, the compiler tells me I have no type errors in my program, including all the queries. There are no type errors in the query. Oh, right. Is that yeah, 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 I, I think a, you you can only do that if you if you know all the queries ahead or right. You have to pre-cook the shape yeah. of the queries, not necessarily all the fill-in parts, but you have the shape of the queries has to be pre-cut. I think yeah. then it almost looks a bit like uh, prepared statements where you uh, basically give the query but not the values, and through that you can. Yeah, you can't really assert type safety, but something along those lines might get you far enough. But and then we get into oh, okay, I have an AST because that's the type safe version of the query, and I can plug in nodes. And now I'm the application developer who's going to plug in type safe nodes because compiler made me do that, which is fine. That's the type safe you're looking for. But I'm not working with a string that I built by concatenating parts as a string, so it's easy to read and debug. I'm working with nodes and AST, so I'm I'm kind of with Cameron now. That that actually sounds like if you wanted it. Early and type safe, type safe string concatenation isn't doesn't yeah, go you, hand in hand. Let's let's start with a question like, what languages have support for something called map reduce? I mean, we could probably say um, I don't know Lisp. Um, oh, does Lisp? The, the generic does type Lisp support out of lots of things would have map okay. reduce. So in in Lisp, when you say map reduce, does map take one? parameter, which is a long string of SQL, and reduce take one parameter, which is a string, which is a long string of SQL? No, it's right. like, no, it takes code. It takes code, right? yeah, right. So, so applications work with code. They don't work with strings, yeah. right. right? You're locking like the Java string uh, streaming pipeline, which the code that you write looks Has nothing like to do. you're building a Lambda, <laughs> but it builds instead yeah. an, a metadata structure of what you're about to do, yes. and it can pop out a Lambda as well. Right. And so basically, basically, you know, this is what I worked on in previous lives. Like you, you, you basically hotspot your database. So it's like, you keep asking me this question, right? So I'm going to start by taking this constituent pieces that you're asking about and automatically index them bi-directional index and try forward index with, so I don't have to hit the disk. I don't have to deserialize, whatever. And then eventually you, you, you bitmap index it because you actually analyze the long tail of the questions, you take the left half of the long tail, the left, the first five columns, and you have a bit mask for each. And now you can answer, you know, a two year question in, in 10 milliseconds or 10, 10 nanoseconds. I mean, it's um, so, so basically, if you if you can't analyze programmatic behavior against the data as metadata, you can't automatically index, you can't, you know, you can't turn the you can't turn what would be an iterative query into a into a O one one op. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we we did similar uh, similar uh, optimization at uh, our framework at Twitter for uh, data processing. What's it? What's it called? What's, co Sorry. what's called scalding? It is on Scala, and basically we capture a lot of like we building a lazy query and then we execute and in the middle of uh, between executing and getting uh, building this query we try to optimize uh, basically doing free monad 
and optimize this monad and get this run. And another technique what we used, it's adaptive uh, optimization. It's basically don't know anything about your Lambda, but it know what data you try to access. And then mm -hmm. we try to optimize based on whatever you're accessing more and capture runtime information, try to optimize how to run and where to run your Lambda closer to data, far from data or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the same problems. That's, that sounds like there was a distributed system as well. Yeah, it was uh, running on Hadoop. Uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty agnostic framework. Uh, right now, they are moving from Hadoop to Spark, but basically, uh, the idea is the same. Uh, before you get into frame, framework uh, execution engine, you need to uh, make sure that this query is make sense and uh, customer don't read all the data at once uh, in memory or something like that. Right. Yes. It's an easy mistake to make where you're building up some structure that you don't realize is going to be the entire size of the data set. Yeah, especially when like you have methods, what is uh, what this looks like just you working with one element, but it's actually could pull data to building index or doing some monoid uh, sum or something like that. That's easy mistake. Yeah, let me go read the feed of all of the likes and figure yeah. out how many likes each tweet's got. And you're like, oh, actually, this is an in-memory data set the size of all the tweets. Yeah, or if you need to distribute a join, like you need to, on one hand, you need to know how to join and load in memory this uh, table, and sometimes you can't. Just I think that idea of building up series of computation rather than actually doing everything every step, that was the old paper, cons should not cons its arguments, right? Oh, the list the guys were like, we should be able to have infinite lists, but yeah, we can only do that, that if we're lazy. I'll link to that one in. That, that's one that I haven't seen in a long time. I just spent the last summer doing H2O versions of the TCPH queries, which were all about, you know, suck it all in memory or change the shape from this to that or go find a bajillion join versions, and join it this way or join it that way. It was an entertaining summer. It's the tail end of what you can and can't do if you change your data set structures around. Hell a lot faster than what those guys are doing, but different, different approach. Actually learned about that one from a talk given by Guy Steele. Throw the link into. Um... I did. It's uh, links eleven and twelve. Oh, ahead of the scalding. Ha 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 ha. Uh huh. And there's a YouTube video. Oh, okay, I'll have to go look at that. That was fun. I didn't realize there was a video for those too. I enjoy hearing Guy Steele talk. He's yeah, definitely got some opinions about how software should and should not be constructed. Yeah, yeah. I was I was pretty lucky. He was my next door neighbor at Oracle. Ah. So is that really, distracting to get any real work done? For him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Uh, I never had a chance to work with him for real. I watched a bunch of his talks, though. Yeah, he, say, that surprises wonder. me, considering how JVM centric both of your like, lives have been. Right, right. And he was at Sun for a while, Sun yeah. Labs and stuff. There was a lot of crossover in time, but he's still at Oracle Labs. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But basically, he he wrote uh, JLS for the most part. Uh, and and I think I, most of the JVMs. I mean, he he loves writing documentation really well. Like he's he's just so good at it. Um, but uh, then he moved really more into the lab stuff, 
and wasn't so much working on Java or the JVM, even though he was using it. But he ended up building Fortress. Right. Uh, I think Chapel or Fortress. Yeah, right. Fortress with a team at Sun Labs and then eventually Oracle Labs. Um, Fortress they, is one of those highly parallel APL like things, right? That was the theory. Yeah. He also developed the CUDA extent, well, one of the implementations of CUDA extensions for Java. Um, but yeah, he works uh, He works here in, in uh, the Burlington Mass uh, Sun Labs, Oracle Labs uh, group. So. Yeah. Like forever and a day. <laughs> but what has he done for Scheme lately? Yeah, too many video games in my life. It's fine. All right. We should change topics or I should call it and go help pack for a camping trip. My wife's busy in the background packing and looking at me like, you can come help me. <laughs> I want to talk about Fortress a bit. Oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, Phil Lincoln. I haven't seen Fortress in 10, 15 years. Yeah, it's, I mean, like the, the links are, I, I don't know. They're, they're kind of like, I mean, the best I found is like there's an old internet archive of like their their final report, which is let me see what it is. It's like the project died as in like 2007, 2008, like they just yeah. And then Oracle shut down the website in 2012, but um. I'll throw the wiki link in for it. I, mean, I think it shows a lot of the power of simply promising less. If we've been building things where our sort of core abstractions have been fold left or fold right, and you say, no, my fold is going to be, I'm going to pick two arbitrary things next to each other and merge those two things until we get down to an answer. And it forces you to think about all your problems in this fork join mental model of I've got my problem and it explodes into some giant lattice and then it collapses back down into a single answer. And so, if you can think about your problem in a lattice, you can really paralyze the heck out of it. There you go. I must be actually, hell heavier. Actually, I was looking at their concurrency model. Their concurrency model is not fork join. Their concurrency model is shared memory with transactions. Shared memory so, with transactions. Yes. So okay. so it's uh yeah, it's like STM, software transactional memory. Memory. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I mean I I I lived the Azul giant shared memory box with hardware transactional memory support. We had software transactional stuff going on. We talked to a lot of people about software. Blah, 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 blah. I did a lot of stuff with software transactional memory. Yeah. So what I'm trying I'm to curious. figure out whether it's like the best implementation of concurrency or whether or the worst know, the worst <laughs> I mean, stms do not as as been implemented in the last decade to the decade prior do not scale to large projects well they work reasonably well in the small and in the large they do not work well does anything well, i'd argue i'd process? argue that they're generally non-composable is the bigger kind of design flaw. There, there are issues, a bunch of them. Yeah. Sorry, Jim, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, so I've never seen anything as cool looking as the PS2 cell chip. Um, I don't know, I'm not a chip guy, but that, you know, that whole streaming memory thing is, is not like anything else I've ever seen. Um, so where'd it go? Is that a bad design? Yeah. It proved hard so, to program. So there yes. actually was an article published on this like a few days ago. Let me quickly dig it up. You're talking about where they go. Of... Sorry? No, it's it's, it's, it's about the whole okay. um it, it this article super in depth. I read through part of it and then I just kind of like my, my head basically exploded. I was like, this this is too much info. Um I think the gist of it is that the architecture was too complex from a programmer perspective, and it was too different. Um, like he had to uh, make yeah, specific use of what it had to offer. And so if you had like a cross-platform game, 
which well uh, i would say probably most of them are you don't want to go through this trouble of like okay we have our desktops which run x86 then we have our xbox which runs i think at the time was still power pc then we have our playstation 3 which runs cell whatever the hell that is um it, it ends up being uh quite painful uh, and I, I watched a series on it where I believe the early games in the PlayStation 3 era, they were not very well optimized because people are still trying to figure out you know, how, to, how the hell do you use this thing. And they also showed sort of the amount of code necessary to get started, I think. And I, they compared it to like OpenGL, Vulkan, just the graphics part. And I think in OpenGL and both Vulkan, you basically have to write an entire book to get started. And with Cell, it was like even worse. Like is like yeah. an enormous yeah. amount of boilerplate just so to that, basically print a triangle. But, but the idea with spot. Cell was that you're going to have some main piece of computation, and you're going to have lots of little pieces of side computation that largely don't need to interact with the main piece of computation. With the idea that like this could be your world, and this could be all of your monsters in it making their own independent decisions in sort of a client servery kind of model. There were two. There were two reasons for the architecture. The, uh, they wanted lock-in explicitly because Sony with the PS2 had almost 100% of the market. And they they thought, well, if we can carry those developers forward, we'll screw Microsoft with their silly Xbox thing by having people write games for the PS3 that cannot be ported to any rational architecture. Right? So they thought that they would have everyone buy the, the NADs and it didn't work out that way. Everyone went to Xbox first and then ported everything horribly to the PS3 instead. The, uh, but the other side of it was the Sony's a, a uh, what's it called when you sell to my mom and random people on the street? Consumer. They're a consumer product company, right? They didn't want to put a you know, $120 Intel chip in there. They wanted to put a $2 Sony chip in. So the sell was everything that they could do for $2 and that's it. Right? And so basically, it does a lot of calculations, but to get it to do a lot of calculations, the programmer has to line everything up, kind of like the epic style architecture that Intel killed themselves with. Yeah, 432. Yeah. Right, but there are use cases that it worked very well for. Um, so for example, when we were looking, when America took Iraq, we found a bunch of rigs that had thousands of PS2s in it, PS3s in it that were being used to crack 2G SMS messages so that their equivalent of the NSA could spy on all the cell phone traffic in the country. And that actually works really well for this, like take this message, distribute it to a bunch of cells. They've got a nice partitioned key space. You try all of the keys and you send the thing back. But that just happened to be a problem that fit really well into this massively paralyzable small pieces of work that most cells never have to say anything back to the master except for the one it's like ah, got it here this is what the person said on their text message yeah that, doesn't that seem to have kept uh ps2 i think because the playstation 3 is from like 2007. yeah that would have been too uh, late there was not much the, Saddam Hussein software development yeah that I, I do believe I, I don't remember if it was the u.s air force or the u.s navy they had a whole cluster of playstation 3s um, effectively acting as a sort of supercomputer cluster because it's cheaper to do it that way than to get actual supercomputers. Uh, although I think a couple of years ago they did retire all of them for like uh, proper computers, basically. <laughs> right, because if you have something that does a lot of communication, you know, it doesn't work well for like a weather simulation where the cells all are sending each other messages a lot like crazy, but it works great for try a bunch of keys and report back which one wins. I didn't hear the Iraq story. That was that sounds fun. It was one of those funny stories of like soldiers have weird senses of morality because they'll find some weapons cache that has a bunch of weapons and a couple of million dollars in US cash and then they steal the PlayStation. Interesting. And it's like you're honorable enough to not take any of the million dollars in cash, but you're like, oh, sweet, a game system. I've been super bored lately. I could really use a game station. Right. You might think that no one's going to care at some threshold. You take a gun, you're going to get in trouble. You take a pile of raw cash, somebody notices. 
take a game. Yeah, what, what, uh, what you do is cash in Iraq. Like, you cannot carry it to home, two millions. It's heavy. <laughs> it's big. <laughs> Uh, carry it 20 meters in one direction and uh, dig it in again. Yeah. Yeah, and come back player. after 20 years when we went. You gotta be, you gotta <laughs> be thinking play. ahead there. Yeah, too much, too much hustle. <laughs> PlayStation, it's much easier. And all the boys back at the barracks will like congratulate me and thank me and we'll have a good time. All right. Um, 11.30, been an hour and a half. Uh, anyone else want to pile anything else in here? Uh, I want to ask uh, everyone, uh, is anybody interested in query-based uh, compilers uh, compared to uh, old uh, pipeline approach? I'm sorry, query-based compilers or compilers opposite yeah. queries? No, like uh, architecture to build compiler. Uh, on query based, like you're not asking to compile file, you're asking some queries of your compiler. And like, for instance, Rust right now uh, migrating from uh, pipeline approach to this query approach. And it's very useful for them to build uh, ID friendly or LSP friendly compiler right. when LSP oh, yeah. can ask. There certainly are questions that are very convenient to be able to ask your compiler, like, hey, at this particular file, at this particular character, what is that symbol? What are the possible types that symbol can be? Like, the compiler knows a lot about your code. It would be nice to be yeah. able to ask it. The language server. So yeah, like, when, when you try to build a language server, you, you need to somehow, uh, uh, like, merge your compiler with language server and uh, be able to answer a uh, question from language server. And traditional compilers not, I would say, not very good on these questions because you need to like reparse, recompile, type check, and do every job you have uh, up front and then uh, hit the second uh, world uh, problem, like what is the cache, how to invalidate the cache, how to cache into your AST, how to cache your types in you know, all information. And uh, what Rust try to using and what other people try to propose, like more um, approach where you uh, start from, from queries first, from asking what question you need to uh, answer, and then down to pipeline answer this instead of uh, trying to build compiler what is just compiled type check as a pipeline. I, I did the C2 compiler at Sun. We had all kind of back and forth interactions between the runtime and the classic compiler. So I don't know, it's not a language server because I didn't have to do the bytecode game, but I had a lot of back and forth communication. I don't know if that counts or not. Yeah, it's a and dependency it, graph that's so hard to manage. I, I had a dependency graph between the runtime and the compiler. The runtime manipulated it when classes added and removed. And the compiler had to pay attention, and the compiler added and extended it, and it went back and forth. So there was essentially a shared common database between multiple threads of the runtime and multiple jitting compiling threads. Hmm. That was part of the compiler folks wrote it, and that was part of the whole setup. Yeah, I'm increasingly wondering in a setup like that if it almost makes sense for your IDE to just be a class that you load into your application. Where you're just like, by the way, load my IDE and expose it on this port, and then I will connect to it and have all of my code there and the ability to set breakpoints and do REPLs and inject new classes at runtime. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that would be interesting. You want to hook okay, the, LSP all the time. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, the, the, the thing I did with the web browser for doing performance counters was essentially mm -hmm. a language server, but for the runtime as a whole and the jitted code and the GC and the like. Right. That's already halfway there, but you didn't yeah. have a REPL there. No, I didn't. There was no way to add a new, to load a new That's class correct. using that interface. That's correct. But it feels like you're already halfway toward making an IDE that you can just import, out. start on some port, connect to it with a web browser. It was a read-only operation, but it could read all the core guts of the VM and present them. 
one thing I'm wondering about is if you wouldn't end up writing two compilers in any case, because I'm thinking of bandwidth latency trade-off. The query-based compiler, as used in the Salsa compiler for Rust, is good on latency in that if you have to look up an individual symbol in your IDE, it's only going to lazily perform the computation necessary for that simple lookup and analysis. But if you have to churn through a code base, say 10 million lines of code, I think batch compilers may still outperform this in terms of sheer processing throughput. So if you want to have good performance for that, you may still have to end up writing batch style compiler. And in, it seems to me that you would end up writing two compilers in the end. I'm not sure if there is a way around that. I, well, you I allow yourself to compile as you run and say, I don't have to compile 10 million lines of code to start. I'm just going to compile my main to start. And as well, I discover can, new code, compile you have, it. You have two compilers right away. You have a type safe language one. You have Java C and you have a machine code get generator. Right, right. Yeah, but I'm thinking of two different use cases. Interactive use case like IDE, but yeah. the query based compilers having low latency can be pretty good. And the batch compilation of 20 million lines of code code base, when they may not be very good. Yeah, I mean, think uh, idea think... when you command click on something, it needs to take you right there, right? So you can rename things, but the command click still works, right? Like you, you change through to bar and now you you go somewhere else and command click on bar, it'll take you to what used to be foo, right? Like that's the LSP concept. The, the fact yeah. that the compiler is constantly, it sees a change in the editor, whatever that means. It's, it sees a mutation and it follows the dependency graph to push the changes through the dependency graph so that the every question has an answer that's you know only milliseconds out of date. I think it's I'm the option, uh, Oh, sorry. I'm 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 curious if this problem uh, ever exists, like this uh, disparity between uh, batch compilation of ten millions of uh, lines of code. And yeah. usually, if we need to to compile ten millions of uh, code, we do it on distributed system for compilation of this code. And you've, you've broken it up. But there's a batch processing. There's a typically not LSP. There is a batchness to it. There's phases. When you advance a phase, you forget the prior phase. Certainly in the land of C2, I played games where I had an arena that was a current phase I'm working in. And I was copying from the old arena to the new arena, doing a transformation on the fly. And when I got done, I deallocated the old arena by resetting the arena. And then I reused it to go back. So that information was gone, gone, gone. And, and you went that phase by phase by phase, and then you got your knowing, To add to that, knowing that you are processing in phases allows you to optimize more. For example, the LLVM pass manager explicitly sets dependencies on the passes processing similar data to run after each other in order to have cache locality. So if you are operating on large blocks of code at the same time, you may be able to process this block and then go through a series of passes and keep everything in the cache and never have to go to DRAM. And I think this would be much harder if you are processing item or symbol per symbol in a query based compiler. Yeah. I'm not claiming that you should have two different compilers, but there's performance reasons for the bash thing that are interesting and are unrelated to incremental lookup of something that's a length. I guess the other piece of this is that there's a long path from, I have text to, I have type, an AST with type proven, type safety, well understood, it's type correct. Then there's another long path from that to machine code. And the language server typically grovels around that first path, but not the second path. And you yeah. know the thing I popped out for Hotspot was in that second path, it was all about given type safe, well understood bytecodes, here's the jetted code, here's performance counters, here's the GC state, here's the classes loaded, da, 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 da. here's the history of what went on. It was very useful, it was different. It was not the language well, the, uh, side. 
in that that first part though that you described, that's yeah. I think that's what he's asking about because that's you know you've got someone typing. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, and you you have a yeah you have a millisecond, you know, ten milli something, and you want to rename, yeah. you want to start a refactoring job, you want right. to whatever. And it may right. be the same ten million line code base, so yeah. you don't you don't want the hour delay after the keystroke before you can answer each question. <laughs> Right. Well, the distributed compile build out or incremental jading build out just means that the, the, the 10 million lines to machine code doesn't happen in an hour. It happens incrementally over time and maybe in total it takes an hour, but it doesn't happen right now. Whereas I guess if you're doing a Google build of your whatever, yes, you wait the hour. Whereas the, the language server pieces are all trying to be incremental. The right. jaded pieces don't have to be, but they're not part of the query now. So I'm saying that the language right. server is asking is not asking a question about what machine code got generated here. Well, there may it's not actually be any true for code. yeah, there may not be yeah. any machine code generated. It's never executed. Right. You ain't got no machine code. It's actually true for uh, Rust as well. Like Rust uh, doing query compiler uh, until it got to LLVM, and everything uh, what happens in LLVM it's like standard batch. Whatever the back, it's a box. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. So I think these are two separate things, and they are maybe you call them two separate compilers, but they're doing two separate jobs too. Hmm. With the exception that I could imagine someone wanting to put an annotation on something that says, "Hey, this really should be inlined." At which point you would want your IDE to pop up and underline a thing in a red squiggle that says, hey, you asked for this thing to get inlined and it's totally not getting inlined. Yeah, so there, there yeah, okay. So, so there's a, there's a, I wrote some text that was part of the AST that put a hint in that says inline, right? There's an inline hint that came through. Then there's- yeah. Warn if not inline. The JIT like code that. did or did not inline. And in the case of, you know, inlining, this is like dicey now, Inline in some context, not others. It's never been run before, never been executed. Does it get inline? Well, if I'm compiling ahead of time, maybe I demand inlining, even if it's stupid. Okay. If I'm jitting code, I got no code to jit. Nothing jitted yet. Did it get inline? That's a vacuous question. Yeah, I would not fire the warning. This did not get inlined if it never got compiled. Okay. So now I jit, I, I start interpreting, and after a while, it comes along and it's. I've got some hot code. This is off some cold path. It's reachable, but not getting executed. Do I jit? Do I inline it? It's not getting executed here. There is a hot path where you badly wanted to get inlined. Okay, you know, but performance counters probably got you. Inlining is in, in you know well handled by by performance counters. If you demand it and I don't, then you know it comes back maybe with and the reason I didn't inline it here is because due to the nature of the call instructions, this path has never yet been taken. So it technically can reach it. I'm not going to inline it because no one's ever taken this path. But over here, where it's inlined a lot, and, and, and now I have to report this, right? How do you report it? Inline here, inline not there, inline here because of counters, inline not there because of counter, whatever. It's like the reporting on the inlining guy is funny. Same like register keyword in C, the old register keyword, right? It eventually turned into can't take the address of a local variable, fine, but. Is it actually in a register? Do I care? It mattered at one time, that doesn't matter now. I don't know. Like technology of performance keywords is got like a 10 year lifespan in their scale. <laughs> That's why I tend to like them as a source of warnings more than directions right. to the well, they, yeah, right. they Say you do something and I can express my intent. And if the thing you did did not match my intent, then communicate with me. Right, and I don't know how to communicate the but that's hard to communicate because yeah. there's already 27 places where it may or may not have been inline in context. And I have to say, partially, sometimes it got inline in everywhere you really cared about, but there are some other places where it didn't get inline. And, you know, the warning sign says 27 out of 55 got inline. I think call site inlining may be the answer. So don't put the inline keyword on the definition of the function, but put this on the call site of the function when you care. Okay, and if the call is, yeah, maybe, okay, fine. Call is megamorphic, what's the inline mean? Uh, right. you, you have an N by M problem here. If you do it yeah. with the call site, it's like, well, where are all the places it came from? And yeah, if you do it on the yeah, function, it's like, yeah. where are all the places it went maybe, to? Maybe the answer on that one is- Inline and a megamorphic sounds like a lot of fun, because I could imagine 
I could imagine how to do that. You would do a uh, oh. you you do a binary tree. I cache on... blowout. The totally C two will inline hot targets out of a call site out of many choices, sure. right? If profiling comes through and says one guy dominates, but there are others, you'll get the if the guy inline boom else be called. And you don't want to see that when you. No, right, click no, on I, the thing and say, tell me about this call site and says, all right, well, the vast majority of the time, it's this one call. Right. I actually in line with these that's, two possibilities. That's that second. And everything else is mega. That's that second query piece for the tail end, for the backside. It's not talking necessarily to the front side directly because you said at this call site, okay, that call site himself has been in line in 27 places. Which of those 27 are you asking about? And recursively it goes, right? So instead you have a sea soup of interconnected calls with perf, perf counters everywhere. It's not really tightly correlated to your front end language spec where it appeared at one point in the code that I put a tag on says, tell me if it doesn't inline. That's not what you end up on the far end. So the expression problem here is how does that one tag in this C come back to via the language server come back to at 27 out of 35 places it inline and the others it never got called or da, 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 whatever. There's a lot of things. That's true. There. My first instinct is give me the set of things that this symbol could be. But if that symbol is inlined in two places, I almost want to have a tree of here are the two places you could be. And in the two places you could be, here are the set of things you could be in each of them. Okay, so let me now- Like this starts getting- Yeah, let me you now tell you that in the land of C2 and C1 and, and performance counters, there is totally a case where C1 inlines perf counters. He also does modest inlining and you get separate perf counters for each of the independently inline instances. And C2 reads those in that and preserves that property. So he says, I'm looking at this call site, which called him, it's called him. And those all got inline in C1. So I have this set of counters. I'm looking at the same function, the same method in a different context. It got inline this way, but differently, different set of counters. He'll preserve those counters when he does the math. He'll collect call site specific inline counters and preserve them when he's doing his inline decisions in C2. This is a giant pain in the neck to represent independently of making it pretty in a fucking language server on my screen. It would be awesome. I, I sorted that the hard way. I'm just saying it's a nasty problem. I mean, maybe it's useful. It, and there are reports potentially worse than that if I'm aggregating across multiple servers. It could say in right. the East Coast region, these are the counters. In West right. Coast region, I, these I are the counters. I ran it a dozen times. I recorded the profiles out to desk. I stacked them up. I want to read them in. I mean, I thought like, oh, Arthur's not here right now. He, yeah, that he was doing something. Yeah, like I'm that. aggregating across service instances in different environments, in different inlining places. Well, with, this is like the yeah, high when I say right click, give me the performance counters, that could be a book. This is the high speed, uh, uh, high speed traders want to have a hot warmed up thing where they first profile the hell out of it statically ahead of time, gather the profiles over multiple runs. Like runs when the market's quiet are, are easy and obvious, but runs when the market's doing something dramatic and everyone's piling in and doing a thing and suddenly all your exceptional cases are happening. You want to have them jitted so your latency is good up ahead of time. Yeah, that now was one of the things I was wondering with something like AA. It is very difficult in Java to say ahead of time compile this for me. Uh, because it stumbles across new classes as it's going. Like, yep, yep. there's really not a good way to say, go as far as you can in the ahead of time compile before I start executing. Yeah, I, think I hard wonder hard. what you could do to design your language spec differently to make it easier uh, to look further into the future. Like, not well, necessarily I, perfectly. There's always going to be somebody right. who's, I gave you a string, I called eval, yeah, you code showed up at runtime. Right. So, okay, so, so in the land, so Arthur has a, Arthur's worked very hard, he's not here right now, to do exactly that. So he's made some progress and I can't speak for it, but I know he's made progress. I bailed out because uh, uh, touching a class runs the seal on it before you can make any instance of the class unless you're inside the seal on it. And in, in the, inside the seal net, you're getting hot code that wants to get jitted while the class is getting loaded and hasn't officially been loaded yet because the static seal net hasn't run. 
And these happen at any order, any time, and perf counters come all over the place. And I couldn't come up with a good way to make inline decisions or compilation decisions that were sensible in that context or even correct given that somebody's got a class load that came from a network packet arrival that then turned into perf counter this or that or something was initialized in this order versus that order. Like I couldn't run the seal and it's in order because the seal and it order wasn't well specified from a static compilation, right? That was, that was what got me. I stopped because I couldn't come up with the correct order to run class loading. Given so, a jar file that you start from main, what is the correct order to run the CLNFs? And the answer is it's perfectly static up until you call hash, which gives you a different answer, which gives you a repro rate that's different because you have collisions that are different, which triggers different jitting scenarios, which trigger different other things. Fucking you could become non-deterministic well before main because hash is not deterministic. If I turn on any sort of networking thing and I take an asynchronous call from anywhere, immediately my CLNs are out of order as well. There were half a dozen places I got out of order before I hit main. And I tried. I looked at this one time. Why can't we just pre edit it? No. And it's even worse because the CLNs occur on the thread that first hits the class. So yes. they're not, there's yes. not even a dedicated CLNit thread. To what extent can you solve this with snapshotting points? So in not the Java, I did snapshotting in times past, it can be snap done. In the land of Java, you would have to claim that this seal and it had run, typically because somebody had touched it. But you don't have the touch case unless you preserve the heap as well. Java has that, Java has that though. And they just stopped supporting it last year. Um, that was the, uh, they had an AOT project and it would like, We've been a dozen related, projects. Yeah, it, true. But this was something to do with Grail, if I remember correctly. But they stopped. Oh, yeah, Grail worked hard on this too. Yeah, Grail worked hard on this. I so claim I that assume, Grail claims they part, they at least partially solved it. I don't know where they're at with it. If I assume that every module you import has an init function. Yeah. And it's just a function like any other. Yeah. And I say when I first say to build my thing. Yeah. I am going to load the code and I'm going to call init on the main module. Of every and it's thing. going to import yeah. some set of things and anything it imports, the init gets called on those and anything right. they import, the init right. gets called on this those. This is not the lazy seal in it. This is the eager seal in it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also called closing over a type system, which yeah. is, yeah. which is right. The That's my argument. That if I made. eagerly okay. say, I'm going to call all of the inits, and once yeah. I finished my transitive tree of inits, yeah. Then I'm going to closer. end my snapshot and say, I'm yeah. going to take a snapshot of the system right. right now. Right. And then I push that thing that's got right. a whole bunch of code already compiled right. to my production servers. Right. And then I call start and okay. start so does whatever initialization so it needs. So the first thing this guy does in the CLNet is he opens, a, opens an IO channel to a database and begins reading. Then that's your own fault. If you go into an infinite loop in the init, your compile takes... No. That, well, that happened too, by the way. We had to handle infinite loops in this. We had to have all jitting hot code in the loop. No, I'm talking about this. He's reading the current environment where your intention is at the time the class loads, he reads the environment of the production. You have to make it clear that the seal in it is running right now and he can't pre-cache, for instance, open database channels to a database that's not present at the startup time. Yes, you have to be very clear in your environment to say the thing okay. that gets passed out of init and into start is a value. Um, uh, because you are going to essentially serialize your entire environment out to a yeah. sequence of bytes uh, and load it back in before you call start. There are behaviors that happen at the seal init that are going to happen at your close over time, not at runtime, in the, not at the production time. So at close over time, I might want to open a file, read an SQL query, and pre-cook it, for instance. That's a reasonable thing to do. At seal init time, maybe I want to open the file, read the query, open the database, and pre-run the query. That only works if that query is going to get cached at close over typing time. So you're, you're, the, the, the close over typing system 
that, that does it by simply looking at inspecting types is one thing. One that says, I'm going to execute any arbitrary code and then declare I'm done running that code. That's part of my closer of the type system has a whole nother can of worms. You know, yeah. it, it can be, it can be dealt with. It just, it's a can of worms. Yeah, I mean, I have, you can constant fold, but you got to stop right about there. I have, yeah, yes. There's a point at which I have to stop. And we have to make it very clear where that line is. Or a different to way to some say extent, it. extent, we have that already. If I type make, yeah. I am going to run some arbitrary set of computation that in theory is going to end with me having an artifact to deploy to production. Yeah, but the line, but maybe that's just it. The line of where that artifact ends and the execution runs is a little better to find. Like if you do a, if you do a classical, I'm making a compiler and I have a make to make it, you do a code generator generator. Right, that's basically my argument. Anything yeah. that is in the yeah. build function okay. that I call at the beginning yeah. is the equivalent of computation you put in the make file. That's interesting. And AA doesn't have any inits right now, so that's not an issue. <laughs> Yeah, but you can argue that it should, and then then it's a different problem. Well, that can be more of a standard of practice that right. I say AA and point you at some artifact, and if I say AA my artifact build, I'm going to call the build function, and it's going to do something. Right. And then when I'm ready to actually start my program, I'm going to call main. And what yeah, does build right. do? It executes a function. And what does main right. do? It executes a function. And you just need right. to understand that. Build in main may run in very different environments. They're right, right. There are definitely other languages that have done well with the nets that are all part of the close over initial state. They run arbitrary code. I guess I'm, I wonder I'm, if that I'm, can I'm, all be part of the standard library and I'm none of it part okay of the language. With that notion, and maybe that's the correct answer. So maybe I'll pile in with Cameron and say, yeah, I'm going to close over my type system at some point. I'm going to allow a valve to show up. And it's right. also if okay. you at runtime bring new code in, like yeah, yeah you get what you pay for. You <laughs> brought in new so, code, you get a compile. Right. So Aaron, what I was trying to get at was that it's it's okay to run your class initialization at runtime, but it's also okay that runtime doesn't all have to be at runtime, which is to say, um, let's say in Cliff Cliff gave the example a little bit earlier about you know they want their system warmed up by the open of business, right? Yeah. So they can warm it up and say, save this spot, yeah. okay? save, save point, if you will. And then, you know, roll that out to disk and be able to pick up from there just by rolling it back into, you know, as a shared object. Right. So the fact that it's adaptive, the fact that it's self-optimizing doesn't preclude a human intervention that says, I would <laughs> like to save off this point for future usage. And bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There are funny things you have to pay attention to, but you can totally work them around. You have to wash threads. All the threads have to get relaunched. All your yeah. threads pending on locks and whatever. Your IO channels why, have to be reopened. Yeah. And that's why we don't have any threads. That's why we don't have any um, uh, all all dependent all IO dependencies come from outside, so they're designed to be serialized and brought back. So that's interesting. So what do you yeah, do with injection. um? If A calls B calls C called D, and then I want D box, and then I want to, you know, for IO, and then I want to snapshot and relaunch. How do you, you, you track the A calls B calls C? I guess for you, they all turn into objects right. on your queue. So that's, that's solved already. Right. And, and, and all the things that get passed back and forth, all the things that get passed back and forth are either already guaranteed to be immutable yeah. or they're guaranteed to be a service. So, and in both cases, you know, in neither case can they be mutated within the thing that receives them because the one's immutable and the other is somewhere else. No, right. It wasn't my issue. My issue was restarting involves getting threads to be back with the call stacks buried mm -hmm. halfway deep. And uh, yeah, I had an open file handle. Then I got snapshotted. Then I got restored from snapshotting. Right. What is the thing that's at the file handle when I say, read me the next byte? Right, right, right. And, and I can argue two ways. And one of them is I disallow a snapshot with open file handles. The snapshot is not allowed unless all IO is closed. And therefore on restart, you'll know that you're coming in from a restart and you can begin reopening. 
um, which forces you to reinspect all your assumptions about the state of the world, which is- So I say read byte and it says this file is closed. No, at the time you did the snapshot, I say, you can't snapshot, you have an open file handle. You get, a, you get an error at the snapshot time. So you say, okay, wait, let me close this file. But now my metadata in my application knows that I've closed that file. So on restart, the application knows that it has not yet inspected the state of the disk, which is freshly new, swapped out from under. It's a whole different world out there. He has no clue what it is, and he has to reinspect his state from scratch. It's basically, mm -hmm. you know, the atomic swap version of your application state. You have to inspect right. everybody before you can start making forward progress. And in no theory, very different. You way, may have swapped out your operating system. Everything can be different. The yep. file system for us is injected. So, you know, it's totally controlled by whoever holds the container. So they could choose to do what Cliff said, or they could choose to, to uh, you know, well, restore you'd it have to snapshot is. with that, that file system, or you don't have it at the, at the restart. Like you, right. you, you've, okay. you, you've brought a file system in somehow. Okay, now you're making a snapshot. Does that snapshot include the file system or not? If it includes the file system, hey, you can have open file handles because for far as the, the whole underlying implementation goes, it's just byte arrays and memory and pointers to whatever. It's all part of the snapshot. My point is from inside the application, you have no visibility to any of that. Yeah, at some point- Because you don't even know what a file system is. You just know what questions it can answer, right? So from right. outside, right. If they, if I, they, I, from outside- right. I, I called the file system service and I said, mm -hmm. Mr. File System Service, Please find the file called, you know, dot get ignore. What are the fuck I'm looking right. for? Dot bash RC. Please find this file. Okay. I read some bytes and I stop. Now you snapshot. All right. Now you're waking up from your snapshot again in a wholly new context. There ain't no bash RC or get ignore, or whatever. What are you doing for the guy who called a service? And what do you do for the service who was in the middle of reading a file? Yeah, I mean, if you can't restore it as is, you either don't save it off or you give them an exception when you come back. I okay, mean, those that's what I'm cases. asking. What are you doing when you came back? Right. Our you, choice. You're, I heard so, you say, I will make an effort to restart, look for a bash RC file. Maybe it's an utterly different file. It's an utterly different file system. It has nothing correlated to any bytes I've before. It's a, it's a really? totally an attack. I'm trying to hacker my way into your system. I swap file systems by snapshotting and unsnapshotting you. Here's the here's the adversarial attacker on your snapshot. Read that byte. So one of your we options don't, is we don't I got snapshotted. Out, You're dead. In in our use case, we don't swap out when there is a fiber that's actually running. So within a container, if there's any fiber running, we're not swapping. Our purpose for swapping out is to reclaim all that space. Okay. So right. I heard you say I have a fiber running. I disallow a snapshot. Currently, our use case does not need to snapshot while fiber is running. Uh, not but we can... The user says, yeah. I've got my system active and running. It's doing the right things, but I want yeah. low latency on the restart. So snapshot it to disk. Tomorrow morning at the open of business, I will bring it up and it won't have to warm up, rejet, recompile, blah, 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 be ready to go. So we can do that. The first thing that the, that the holder of the container does is it pauses the container. If you look at the link I pasted yeah. in, that's line 492 is pause. And then it does a store, so it saves it off. That's 522. And then it resumes. So that so at the point where it stores it, nothing can be operating. Right. So there is a, I guess you'd call it a safe point in a sense. I, okay. Right? So when, when when that time to snapshot comes, I've got somebody who's busy reading some random bit somewhere. That's what right. you do, do you That's disallow, right. you finish that and then you snapshot? Um, well, it, you're the one snapshotting it, so you have to be able to provide that same thing at that same state when you restore it. I'm asking the standard file system service, which I don't want to implement my own version of it, to please, Mr. File System Service, snapshot yourself. And then later, right. please, Mr. Ser resume yourself. Right. Okay. At the time, it's not, it's not that it, it's not that it, that's not quite the right question because the file system isn't part of the application it's injected in from the outside yeah that's what i'm trying to get at right yeah well some but there's so an interface don't... there's i assume it's a service that interfaces to the inject okay what's that service do on a restart uh 
That's a good question because it's not a problem we've ever had to. Okay, to I'm, I'm attacking your system by taking a snapshot, changing the file system and going again. How far can I get here? Can I lie and cheat my way past all your security because you're going to let me restart? Like the obvious thing to do is say, fuck you, all your file handles are closed. You got an EOF or did no, no file all handle. The injected, all the injected things have to be able to be re-injected on restart. They're not okay. magical. There's no, there's nothing you can make up from inside a container that gives you access to something that's not inside the container. Yeah, so I'm restarting the the standard ecstasy file system, but in a new file system environment. And at the time it got snapshotted, somebody was busy reading some password security file. Right. So there was state on some object that represented something from the file system. Uh, not something from the file system. He has a handle pointing at the file system and he's physically so don't trying have to handles. read bytes. So we don't have such a thing. You're, you're talking to a Linux system. There's a file handle. It's your only way to get a file handle. Somewhere under the hood, you have a file handle. Right. So, but that's outside of the container that's actually doing the read. So the thing asking for the read doesn't have that information inside the container. Who does? The container outside of it. Okay, that container now, what's he gonna do when I swap file systems on out from under him? I'm claiming that there's a border and you're cutting the file system off and then saying restart. I don't care what you call the border and how you call it, there's a border. You, you excluded border. the file. On the other side, there's something going on in ecstasy. I snapshot, I swap the file out for the one that's my attack file and I restart. What do you do? What, so somewhere in that border, you were peeking through to read so you had a file handle from the OS that you read a byte and you're bringing it back in and you're handing it off to other people. Okay. You snapshot for the, for the close. The OS closed that file handle because the OS is just going to close it when your snapshot's done. You don't need any say in that. So you're done, you're baked, you've got a blob on disk. Now you restart. You restart the blob, it comes up. There ain't no file handle there. The service was in the middle of reading a byte and a file handle. It's on a restart and a resume. What happens? Well, the, what got stored in the binary is a reference to something that got injected, meaning it has to, it has to ask that, that reference for an encoding, and then it has to be able to turn back around and say, I need this re-injected. Okay. Right? So, um, but we don't have, um, because we've never even hit this use case, we don't actually have a specific thing where the thing that's holding on the container can actually answer that specific question in terms of restore the state of the injected mutable service. So you don't have a snapshot is what I just heard you say. You have an have... incomplete snapshot, something snapshot, but like file system access does not. We don't have a solution that handles it for the injected references, yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, I, we just haven't hit the use case. Well, okay. I, I'm arguing that you should be pondering the attack mode. No, I'm pondering it right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the code. <laughs> no, it's uh, just, it's never come up. So it's a good question. Okay, fine. I totally did a snapshot thing a long, long time ago for a PostScript clone on a fourth based system, whatever. We made it work, but files were done. We're, we're like, no, the snapshot blew an error if you had an open file handle going on. That was that was my way around that one. All right, fine. Now I definitely got to go. <laughs> so um, having just you know made Cameron's day, um, I'm going to declare victory and run away. And hopefully I won't drown in the rain. And I'll see y'all in a week. Thank you all. Stay dry. All right. Bye. Bye.